Hi, welcome to today's Postgres conference webinar. Um, Timestamps, time zones, and interval arithmetic. What you need to know and what you don't need to know. We're joined by Bryn Llewellyn, Technical Product Manager at Yugabyte, who will explain how Postgres, and therefore Yugabyte, give you sufficient functionality to let you straightforwardly and correctly meet any requirement that might be set in the date time space and how they provide far more functionality than a correct implementation will need. My name is Lindsay Hooper. I'm one of the Postgres conference organizers and I'll be your moderator for this webinar. A little bit about your speaker. Bryn is a technical product manager at Yugabyte with a specialty in SQL and stored procedures in the context of distributed SQL. Bryn started off doing image analysis and pattern recognition at Oxford University, programming in Fortran, and then worked in Oslo, first at the Norwegian Computing Center and then in a startup. Bryn has worked in the software field for more than 40 years. He started working with SQL when he joined Oracle UK in 1990. So that's all from me. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off to Bryn. Take it away. Good, thank you very much, Lindsay, for that introduction. Um, I'll assume unless anyone shouts that you can hear me clearly enough, and you know the title now. Um, the subtext or the way of paraphrasing the title is that um, the whole terrain, everything to do with this time stamp and date time and everything is vast. And um, there are times, sadly, when you have to understand the stuff in detail, but if you're lucky enough to be doing new work, then you can skip tons of it and follow some straightforward guidelines to um, be safe and get all the functionality you need. Um, so moving on then, um, who am I? I'll be as brief as I possibly can, and I'll say a tiny little bit about what I expect from the audience, but it's too late to change my approach if I'm wrong. Um, so that's me. And the simplest way to get um, the story is to just Google for Postgres person of the week and my name, and you'll find my little essay on myself there. And that's good enough, plus what Lindsay just said. So um, this is what I'm assuming about you, that you really know Postgres very well, um, to the extent that hardly a week goes by without you typing stuff at the PSQL prompt. Um, sometimes SQL and one would hope sometimes it's create or replace procedures and functions. And you certainly don't need me to tell you about why SQL is good. I'm not going to attempt that, that, that bit of um, proselytizing today. And it doesn't upset you at all that the ideas are somewhat mature, to put it mildly, that the foundations of all this stuff were laid in the 1960s. Um, now, it's not essential that you've had any exposure to what I work with, Yugabyte DB, but, and I'm not gonna dwell on that today. The simplest thing to say is that Yugabyte DB, if you approach it from the PSQL prompt or from our slight, subtly different variant of the same animal called YSQL SHA, then um, for all the sort of code that I'm showing you today, you'll see no difference at all. You might see a difference with create table statements because we have special extra clauses that reflect the way we do things at the storage level. You'd expect that. But um, you can find out a lot more about Yugabyte DB elsewhere, but the simple short thing to say about it is that it brings Postgres func functionality that you all know and love to a um, scheme that has the distributed SQL benefits of the trailblazer in this space, Google Spanner. Um, in other words, fault tolerance, scalability, and so on. Cloud native, you name it. Um, so you may well find this whole business of date and times and all the operations you do on them mysterious and daunting. That's okay, because that's what today's talk is about. In fact, the more mysterious you find it, the more perhaps you'll benefit from today's talk. So then, um, without further ado, um, I'll be skipping tons of detail because I think I can rely on the fact that it's well documented. And I'll just click on this link to show it's real. 
Um, here we are. This is our doc on the public internet. This is the date and time major section, and it's rather big. And among the things it's got in it, there's a top level table of contents. So you can see indeed it's rather big. But um, going back to this um, thing down the bottom, if your aim is just to do brand new work, you can survive with a smallish subset of the whole lot. So that was that. And then the other point is that, um, back to the slides, which are um, here, there's downloadable code that includes various utilities that I wrote when I wrote this documentation. Not to keep it a secret, I wrote all that documentation. And to do that, I had to study the stuff in depth. And when I was doing it, I found it very difficult, frankly, because this is the perfect ex example of where the Postgres doc is um, rarely, if ever, wrong, but um, so terse that at times it takes a slow-witted person like me forever to understand it. And I have to do no end of you know, empirical tests to question and confirm my understanding to date. Anyway, in order to make all that a lot more straightforward, I've, and indeed then to um, rein in some of the complexity, I wrote various utilities, here they are. And without further ado, I'm gonna download the zip now. It'll just go shooting down onto my downloads folder, which is, um, let's see if I can find it, um, up here. So there we are, I've just got that thing downloaded. I don't need the Savari any longer. What I'm going to do is bring it into the little directory I've created for today's talk. There it is. Um, you can see three items in it. And I'm going to go over to my live environment here where I'm just at the OS prompt. And I'm going to check where I am for my own sake, not for you. And there I am, I'm on the downloads folder and I'm in this um, particular folder for today's project. And what I've got in there is my own slides, which you'll get a copy of. And then um, a directory where I've got little snippets of code and this utilities thing. So if I go on to the utilities thing, and if I start up our own PSQL, I've got a little shortcut here that does it and signs me on as the super user. And I've got another shortcut, I'm not going to explain all this, who drops, if he existed, a user called U1 and recreates it, brand new empty. And you can see there's nothing there and nothing in the way of, um, sorry, nothing in the way of user created functions either. That will change now because um, if I have a quick look at what's available on where I stand. Sorry, what have I just done? Hey, Bryn, can yes? you increase the size of the fonts just a little bit? Of course, of course, of course. Uh, and remind you. me all the time. I um, will shrink them and grow them according to taste, and I forgot to do that. You don't have to read all this stuff. The, the, all you, the message of this is, I'll, is that, you know, there's a lot there. I'll do it one more time. Um, you know, there's a load of stuff there, but um, there's a readme and it tells you that you've just got to run this particular one guy. And here we go. It's all going to crank in, never mind how long it takes. It won't take longer than it takes me to say this sentence. And when it's done, you'll see um, when I repeat those exploratory commands that I've got a number of views or, and one table, which are useful in various contexts, as we'll come to see. And I've got a fair number of um, procedures. You'll see this report now is illegible unless I take it down to microscopic size. Sorry. So I don't expect you to read this. Don't get panicky. I'm just going to take it down one step and um, crank it out. Even that was too, too big. But you can see there's loads of stuff, OK? And I'm not going to try to explain it all. And I'll use a few of them 
and I won't even um, in particular um, explain what how they work, rather I'll just rely on them because it's all in the doc. So enough of that. Um, now I'm just going to get myself ready so I don't get confused when we start by going up one and onto my code examples. And there's just a number of little files there. So we're ready on that. You know, the pump is primed and I can continue with the talk itself. So here comes the main point then. Um, so this date time apparatus is vast and complex. Why is that the case? Well, partly because they are simply inescapable facts of life. Astronomy is what it is, you know, <laughs> the earth goes round and round and round on its own axis, um, which happens to be sloping with respect to the plane of its orbit, <laughs> which also plays into the picture. And then, um, you know, the, the earth goes around the sun um, and the number of rotations of the earth it takes for the earth to go around the sun isn't an integral number. Why should it be? You know, no one said it ought to be, and it isn't. And of course, um, human beings started caring about all this lot because of their crops and who knows what a long time ago. And all sorts of weird superstitions came in and rules of thumb. And we've ended up now, after all sorts of chipping away and iterative changes to the whole way of thinking, with what we've got. Mysteriously, there's a year's you know, minus one and a zero plus one and no year zero. Who would have guessed that? But that's the way it is. And I won't even go into why the particular year that's missing between the two is when it is, something to do with mythology that some people believe in, you know. So all, all that stuff plays in. And how long is a month? Who knows? 28 days, 29 days, 30 days, 31 days. Those are all correct answers. So how many months are there in a year? Some would say 12, but it all depends how long a year. On and on it goes. So no wonder it's complicated. Um, the SQL standard folks introduced some notions in succession iterations. Like at one point, there was a date data type and nothing else. And if you subtracted two dates, you got an integer, meaning the number of days between them. Then they came along with this timestamp notion, which was, um, you know, more precise in at least the world of PostgreSQL because it brought in the time of day component. And then, you know, in the same breath, they brought in a time zone sensitive thing and all oh, the whole complexity of daylight savings time and calendars and everything was unleashed in a way that it hadn't been before. And subtracting two timestamps gives you an interval, while subtracting two dates gives you an integer. If you were doing it from scratch, you wouldn't have that. That's what I mean by inconsistency. And then early versions of Postgres implemented what I am convinced are utterly questionable at best decisions, I would say wrong decisions that no written down requirement spec could ever have justified, but it is what it is. And nothing like that can be changed in databases because if it were changed, there'd be some existing app out there that would break. So given all that lot, you can most certainly easily go wrong. Now for new work, the good news, you can manage with only a tamed subset of this whole shooting match. And that does depend on some user-defined utilities. So that's my main point for today. And I'll be sketching lots of it because the time is relatively limited. And then, um, well, my um, fallback is that it's all in the docker I wrote. So then the various topics, I won't tell you how I'm going to do it in advance. I'll just tell you as we come to it. We'll talk about time zones first of all. And time zones themselves are a completely artificial concept. Really, the sun is vertically ahead, or as close to it can be, depending on your latitude. You know, it's at its... Um, highest point in the sky, at least, um, at the same moment on a given line of longitude. But um, if you just move a couple of meters to one side, then it'll be at its highest point a little bit later or earlier, depending on where you are. 
So there's no such thing as a, you know, sun noon as a universal constant. And pretty soon people decided it would be unworkable to have every spot on um, each different line of longitude having its own time scheme. So they eventually, long story short, came to a scheme where there's time zones, where all the spots in a given time zone, which is loosely speaking a politically defined area of the planet, they um, just assert that noon is at a certain time, whether or not the sun is at its peak at that moment. I'm sure you all could have said that in your own different way, but that's the background. So people have always organized their lives by the sun and you simply can't get away from that. Some people like the People's Republic of China do a radical one time zone policies that, <laughs> that, that stretches over about what will be three or four time zones in the US. It's the same time everywhere. Well, that's the way they did it. I'm happy for them. Um, and there's a view called PG time zone names, which lists the names and various other properties of the time zones that at least Postgres supports. And there's a lot of rows there, practically 600. Um, I'm just going to mention, and I won't keep on stressing it, that our Yugabyte DB is based presently on Postgres 11.2. But with respect to the functionality that I'm talking about, 14 hasn't made any change to it, so it doesn't really matter. But little details of how many rows there are in this thing change. And last time I looked in um, the latest I tried, it was 594 for what it's worth. And I've tried to tame uh, this story a little bit in ways I'll sketch later by creating an extended time zone views and uh, deriving other things from it. And this leads to two useful views that I'm going to show you now. The point of canonical is that this here is based on facts that you can get off a publicly available, widely respected central database. And that database has all sorts of facts, like, for example, if a given time zone is canonical. Well, that status the Postgres people didn't think was worth recording, but it's very useful because, for example, there are two time zones, one called Asia Kathmandu and the other called Asia Kathmandu, but one is spelt with a T and the other is spelt with a TH. One of them is canonical, one of them is not. And if you didn't adopt some discipline and use always the canonical one, you'd have a job with your usual global search and replace kind of operations. So there's that sort of stuff going on. And I find it very useful just to derive two views, ones who do observe um, daylight savings time, ones who don't, and they are of status canonical, which means among other things that are going to be tied to a real geographical area and then the modern names for these things. And there's 39 distinct offsets across these views. So this is a query that um, using my views um, can get the distinct time zones. The point being that in the no DST things, all you have is a UTC offset, but in the ones with daylight saving, there's one offset in standard time and one in daylight savings time. So to get the distinct things, you do just do this little dance here. And um, I'll just show you the technique now. All these code samples that I intend to run, they're in files. And if I just um, start up now as um, number one, and um, I'll give myself a little bit more space there. And if I run this query, which is 01, sorry, then sure enough, there is a 39. And there's all sorts of weird animals there that happens to be Kathmandu. I've looked at that often enough to know where it's you know, three quarters of an hour um, plus some whole number of hours out of step with um, UTC, how strange is that? There's another one there, you know. Anyway, um, that's that point made, and there it is on the slide. And my recommendation is that whenever you set the time zone 
in the section or mention it in other syntax context that I'll come to. Then you use only names that come out of this. And I'll show you a scheme that ensures that you do that presently. Right then. So what is this business then of setting the time zone? The main thing to understand is that you set is perhaps the wrong word, specify is a better word. And there are three different syntax contexts that use the specification of a UTC offset. And by the way, you can specify the offset either directly uh, by name, sorry, indirectly by name or directly as an interval value. I haven't said what an interval is, but I assume that you've got a rough idea or a good idea. An interval is just a data type who measures a duration of time in a rather weird way that it will come to later, but um, never mind that now. So these are the contexts. You can simply set the environment parameter with, confusingly enough, set time space zone name or some other spell or set time zone or one word equals and something. And the syntax of what follows that can vary, um, or I should say different variants are allowed in those two different spellings. How confusing is that? Um, anyway, that's one setting you can do it in. The other is in um, <laughs> at time zone, which is an operator. And just to make life again harder to talk about in simple words, there's a function called time zone, which has identical semantics but it's more convenient to use this function usually because it's more normal in its general form. You know, at, what, what is this operator? It's weird, you know, three words in it. And, uh, and then the other place is within the definition um, that you make for a timestamps value. It might be using this function called make timestamp, TZ, or it might be in a literal value for a timestamp, TZ. Um, either way, you can mention a time zone there, and that's the third context. So um, there's a <laughs> this is a perfect example of what I mean by saying that the area is littered with bombshells unless you adopt a minefield. Uh, sorry, it's it's a minefield unless you adopt a discipline, because um, sorry, as we'll see in a moment, this is a name to be found in PG time zone names. But this, which looks so similar, is not. And if you do this query, you see only one of them come out. But nevertheless, if you set your time zone equal to the one who's not defined, you don't get an error. What the hell is going on there? If you want to waste a morning, you can um, Google and eventually perhaps you'll get to the bottom of it. But you also read no end of confusion from no end of punters on stack exchange and that kind of thing going on about it. Long story short, this happens to be a legal expression within what they call post POSIX syntax. And that's a more explicit way of specifying facts about the time zone you want, which Postgres implemented in historical times because a lot of the other ideas weren't mature. And because they did it then, they can't take it away and we're stuck with it. But it means, you know, you can slip up no end because if you set it to that and then, you know, do a query where you observe the effect of it, you see, oh my God, it came out as plus 99. You're normally used to writing America, Los Angeles here, which we know is seven hours behind. And that means that the time in, um, you know, shifts the other way. And you'll see a plus there. But here it's this, you know, on and on and on. I'm not going to spell it all out. Otherwise, I'm bound to say the wrong, not in the wrong place. But basically, this, sorry, is counterintuitive. And um, we can see more clearly what's going on here. If we query up America Los Angeles, which is sometimes eight and sometimes seven, minus by convention, and then if we query up this one, which is there in the view with a minus eight, well, <laughs> it comes out as plus eight here. And that's just, you know, like some people drive on the left and some people drive on the right. These POSIX guys thought that um, 
you know, the offset would increase in one direction and the um, other guys who inspired the basic way Postgres does it, took the other direction. So there's two different conventions at work. What's the result? It can only be confusion. And the moral of the story is these days, this POSIX malarkey brings no ultimate benefit because you can get full functionality in other ways. So don't go near it with a barge pole. And to avoid going near it with a barge pole accidentally, you have to adopt some conventions and it's always better to enforce these conventions with user-defined functionality, functions or that kind of thing. Right then, so um, I'll just illustrate this in a second to convince you that the script is there. But if I set the time zone to UTC, so that at least I know what I'm going to see when I query up time zone, sorry, timestamp TZ values. If I set the time zone in this formulation, time zone, blah, blah, with the time in question as a raw timestamp, and if I cast it to text and do it, you know, using these different um, spells, America Los Angeles, or make interval of minus eight hours, or this here thing, or God knows, you know, to emphasize the point, foo minus eight. You can guess there's then foo minus eight in the um, PG time zone um, names view. Well, this is the result. These two come out the same because I started at 1 a.m. here, um, 1 a.m. here, then I get to 9 a.m. You know, in, in London, let's say, when it's 1 a.m. in San Francisco, it's 9 a.m. in London. And if I use these other things, who look so superficially similar with a minus eight, it goes the other way. That's the confusion. So I'm not going to run that code because the code produces this result and it's there for you to run yourself. So more about the problem then. Um, this is just the same thing in the other syntax setting where I've got a plain text thing here, which is part of the specification of a timestamp TZ value. And um, I'm just going to concatenate onto it one spelling of the time zone and the other spelling of the time zone and see what I get. And here we have it again. This one comes out at 9 a.m. and this one goes the other way back to the previous year at five in the afternoon. Strange, isn't it? Just all that lot can, can, for, can confuse people no end as is evidenced by all the rubbish on Stack Exchange and the like. Um, but if you deliberately avoid it, then you have a simple, clear life. Right then, what's the recommended practice? Well, um, there's a doc section, which is exactly, see if I can select this. This is annoying that PDF never really works for copy and paste very well, but I got it then. If I go over to the docs, which is here, and if I um, show you there exists a table of context, contents, which is useful to have, um, it's actually up there already. Here it is. If I search in the page for that, and if I go on it, there we've found it. And you can read about that. I'll um, refer to it very briefly now. Um, I'm trying to give you a taster of what there is to find and show you the effect of it all. So it brings to a procedure, set time zone, um, and you can provide either a text or an interval argument. And that obviously is a wrapper around the real set time zone. And it just makes sure on the one hand that the text is approved uh, in the sense that I went on about. And if it's an interval, that it's in a sensible range like you don't go shooting 99 hours into the future. And then this at time zone thing is obviously a wrapper for the native time zone thing with the same overloads. And that does the same thing to make sure that the, whether you give it as text or as an interval, it's legal in the way I just described. And use these and never use the raw functionality. And it ensures you get only the approved things. It's, might be hard, you know, once when you do it one morning and settle down and wrap your head around it to understand why it could go wrong. 
if you just accept it could go wrong, I'm not going to go wrong, I'm going to use this method and adopt that as a rule, then you'll be golden. Okay, and here's an example. It's just showing you um, some weird effects and then it's showing you, sorry, not weird effects, it's showing you using these and using sensible values. And then um, it's um, going on to show that if you do it wrong, you get some errors that I programmed in. So let's just look at that. That would be, if I'm not mistaken, number three. Nope, sorry, what did I say it was? Forgive me, number four, I skipped the head of it. Right, and it seems to be a lot of code because I don't like seeing these errors come out raw on the screen because the error is embedded in about 17 lines of rubbish. I prefer just to do the thing in a stored procedure or a function it might be and um, catch the exception and get the important information and print it out neatly. It's one of the most annoying features of Postgres, there I'll say it, is you can't write an anonymous block that produces sensible readable output. The only way you can get several lines of readable input in some little ad hoc demonstration of functionality is to use a table function. Once you accept that, it's not hard to do, but it seems a bit of a pain to have to do it. So I'm just gonna run this thing um, after I clear the screen. Sorry, I always forget the eye. Okay, and that, that's what I was talking about. You just see sanitized and useful information. So I arranged this message and it says that this thing is invalid and you should instead use a thing that you find in this, this view. Um, and you can guess that this view is yet another um, thing I, provided in the kit. There it is. And it's got the name and the various um, abbreviations and offsets. Okay then, um, enough of that. Um, so we've done that, we've done that point. It might have seemed to be a lot of talking, but the upshot is simple. Encapsulate those um, important ways of setting or specifying the time zone in the way I said, and you'll be okay. So now we're moving on to a different thing. You know, what do I mean by moment? Moment is a neutral term of art I've invented, but I don't suppose I'm the only one who invented it, to be a super class for date, plain time, plain timestamp and timestamp TZ, timestamp with time zone. They're just different ways of specifying um, instant, a moment in time. And these are the ones. You might wonder why time with time zone or time TZ is not in the list. Well, the Postgres documentation says, don't use it. Even they say, steer clear of that with a barge pole. It's a pain that it had to be done because the SQL standard guys thought it was a good idea. I won't even go into the story of why it's a rubbish idea. Um, <laughs> It's good enough for here and now that even the Postgres doc says it's, it's rubbish. So then, um, this is a simple way to view it. Dates, well, you know what a date is. Time, you know what a time is. A time is constrained to be within midnight and just before midnight the next, the same day. And then plain timestamp is just those two facts lumped together in one datum. And then timestamp TZ, difficult to say this clearly, but it's on disk representation is indistinguishable from the plain timestamp representation. It's exactly the same facts. The key thing about this is that the metadata that comes with this type rather than this type knows that it's time zone aware, which means at the moment you record a value, it's converted into its absolute plain timestamp value in UTC, and at the time you read it, in other words, when I say read, what I mean is cast it to text, um, either by the typecast or by a two char, then the, that operation is sensitive to the reigning time zone. 
So that's the critical difference between these. And long story short, then, um, given this here, even today's talk, when you looked it up, it said it takes place at such and such a time, 1300 EST. Actually, it actually said EDT because we're still in summer um, time. I would say that's a silly way of doing it. Sorry, Lindsay, but it should have said America, New York, because that's one of the canonical time zones. And it's up to you to know if you're in summertime or not. Um, <laughs> but nevertheless, um, that's what I'm getting at. And um, the point there, obvious, today, almost everyone, I know one of us on this call, every few hours at least, interacts in some way where you have to say to your mate, wait a minute, what, where are you? What's the time where you are? What's the time where I are? How, what's the difference? When can we meet? When will be a comfortable time? There's nothing you do that doesn't need this time zone awareness. And though some people are superstitiously afraid of it, if they steer clear with it and use this, well, they'll be far, 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 far worse off as I'll show you. So there's a clear recommendation. Always prefer this one for data that you persist. You can always, if it's useful to you, record the reigning time zone offset and name by the side of it in partner columns. And I'll show you in a minute how you can take advantage of that because then you've not lost any information. If you used um, you know, plain, UT, plain timestamp, and if you wanted the flexibility that you're bound to one, you'd have to do this anyway. And you would have to compute your own conversions and have your own calendar somewhere, oh, yeah, rubbish. So far better just to, to do all that lot. And you can always derive plain timestamp date or time from this timestamp TZ in whatever time zone you care about for display purposes or for, you know, um, on the fly purposes. And that is my very strong recommendation. Record this, this is the canonical form that you want to record, derive the other things as and when you might need them. If you believe you've got a good reason for not following that advice, then what you must do is write up in an external documentation of your project, why you're doing that. And I bet you'll find as soon as you try and type those sentences and make a logical justification, it'll evaporate under your feet. So here's an example. Um, this is just a little function, of sorry, who shows you how to get the reigning, reigning time zone offset. All you've got to do is um, take the time at the moment. It's perhaps best to take the time of the ongoing transaction rather than what the wall clock happens to read, but that's a very subtle point. And then if you use this, this is the function spelling of the extract operator um, to get the time zone hour and the time zone minute. That will tell you the information you need. All you're going to do then is convert that into an interval value, and that's your answer. And then um, here I am creating a table. Obviously, it's got one of these in it. Forgive me for using serial and not big serial or UUID or something. For tests, it's less typing and less to talk about. And then these are the important columns. Um, when was it created as a um, time, sorry, yes, as a timestamp TZ? What was the reigning um, time zone as an interval? And what was the reigning time zone name as a text? And what did I do? Right. And then here we go. I just set the time zone to something. Um, you know, on the um, left-hand side of, of Greenwich. And um, this is when I arrived in Los Angeles, uh, or when someone did, three planes arriving at the same moment in this demo um, all over the world. Same thing in London, same thing in Kathmandu, spelled with TH, you'll notice. And um, then if I query up, uh, I have to set the time zone to something so that I know what I'm seeing when I query this way. And what I'm seeing is that um, the actual times of day as they're recorded 
are, given that each one happened slightly after the other, identical because they've all been normalized. Um, this is the time zone um, interval when it happened, and this is the name where it happened, and this is what happened. Um, and now here's a demo of a more useful way to see it. If I just take this um, thing that I recorded, the time zone, the created time zone, sorry, the created time stamp TZ value, and the offset that was raining at the time, then I can use this guy to cast it to a plain time stamp. And with it as that status, then I can um, cast it either to a date or a time and use these format masks to display it in a more conventional fashion. And this is my result. So thinking of local time, I arrived on Tuesday this date at that time in the evening. And at exactly the same moment, a colleague in a different plane in a different part of the world arrived in London as it happens on the next day in the small hours of the morning. And the third colleague, also in his plane, touched down at the same identical moment, arrived in Kathmandu even later in that next day. And that's a more useful way of seeing it. So this is my assertion for you that um, you get exactly what functionality you would ultimately want by doing things in this sensible fashion and you don't need to understand any more. So just to prove a point now then, this was number five. So um, here it is, this is everything I showed you. Don't have to show you one more time. And um, if I just run it, I assume you're gonna believe me for most of the time now. There's no real value in showing this time and again, unless I want to enlarge a bit of this print and run it for itself. But what I could do, but I'm not gonna waste time on it now, is do this identical thing using vanilla Postgres and you'd see that the um, results are indistinguishable. Right then, back to the plot. How am I doing? Not too bad. Um, now we're going to look more closely at this time zone sensitivity of the conversion of a timestamp value to a text value. And I have to say that many people I speak to, even among my colleagues, can't formulate their thoughts in this space in any clear way. So exam for example, they'll have a time stamped TZ column in a table, they'll select it, and they'll see stuff on the screen, and without really thinking, they think they're seeing that value of the timestamp TZ value as it's recorded. They don't understand that <laughs> the PSQL and all other things like it that have to show the end user text inevitably have to do a conversion from timestamp TZ to a text value. Either they do it as PSQL does it, as an implicit time, sorry, an implicit typecast that unless you think clearly, you forget is happening, or they do it with two char, but both of those, those operations, the implicit timecast, actually the explicit timecast too, typecast too, and the two char, they inevitably are sensitive to the reigning time zone. And if you don't keep that first and foremost in your mind, and especially when you do experiments to show yourself that you understand what you think you understand, I tell you, you will just <laughs> confuse yourself and anyone you try and discuss your code with it. So here's a contrived app that does things right, but it makes the point. Um, it's you know a ludicrously slimmed down version of an app whose purpose is to create meetings. One person creates a meeting wherever they happen to be, and other people can view it because they're interested in it too. And the assumption is they're all using some tool like a conventional calendar app on any old laptop that itself has a preference setting somewhere that um, records the time zone you want to think you're in when you're doing this. Of course, if, if I'm um, off in London and I'm trying to arrange some meeting somewhere, I might just set my time zone to back home so I don't get too confused and then in my preferences and then set it back to where I really am at the moment. That's beside the point. There's always a time zone known 
in the environment of these apps where they do stuff. So then, um, here I've got myself a table, meetings, and I'm just going to have a primary key in it, of course, and the time of the event. This is as slimmed down as it could be. I'm not even going to bother to say what the event's about. And then I'm going to make myself a little um, prepared statement who inserts two rows. That's what I mean by saying it's a bit of a contrived app. But this is the, if you like, this is the app. And there's another query, um, sorry, another prepared statement who queries things up. And notice that um, it's spelt in a way that doesn't mention the time zone at all. It's expecting that it'll be sensitive to the time zone in the environment. Obviously, I could have done stuff in here to hard code the time zone that I wanted to see things at in some way, but that would be not useful. So I'm just getting out the meeting ID and when it is. I hope that makes sense. And then here's the scenario, Ricky, you know, Ricky Lee Jones, obviously she lives in LA and she adds two meetings and views what she's got. So this is happening though she didn't notice it in her environment of her calendar preferences. And there they are, the two meetings. And that the dates are cunningly chosen to be before and after the um, spring forward date here in LA, or there in LA, I should say, but here in California. Um, and then when it's done, when the meetings are created, we in the same time zone, of course, query to see what we've got. And what we get is we see, yeah, they're both as I wanted at eight o'clock in the morning. And they'll have to do that because some guy is gonna be in Europe. And um, one of them is the 9th of March and the other is then, oh, but, oh, look, here's this little subliminal clue. They're both in LA, um, America, but um, one of them is PST, you know, standard time. The other is daylight savings time. Obviously, because we're before and after the um, spring forward date, that's why the minus eight and the minus seven. So if she really cared to think about it, Ricky would work out that some guy in Amsterdam might you know, experience something funny here, uh, because here we are, Vincent, Vincent van Gogh, he obviously lives in Amsterdam, um, he views his meetings, but obviously this is happening unbeknown to him explicitly, it's just in his preferences, and when he queries up, he sees, well, they're on the dates I expect, but good God, one of them is at 17 and the other's at 16, what, what a pain has, has um, you know, Ricky whimsically changed the time in the meeting for this other one. Well, he hardly needs to know. All he needs to know is that um, they're at those times on those dates from his point of view. Um, but if he looks more closely, he'll see, um, well, they're in the same time zone. And if he got on the phone and asked Ricky what's going on, she would eventually fess up that, ah, there's been a daylight savings time. And then they'd both argue about it and they'd both get on Wikipedia and they'd find that, <laughs> stupidly, uh, the country that still uses inches and feet and so on changes its daylight saving on one date and the continent that uses the metric system changes on a different date. There are many examples like this. Don't get me started on the how you spell a date, whether it's month, day, year or the other way around. And anyway, the explanation is clear. But no one wants to have to think all that lot through. They just want it to happen implicitly. And I hope you can see that this code here guarantees it simply happens implicitly. That's the point. If you use the time zone TZ data type religiously and properly, then you'll get what you want without having to write any special code. So then, by the way, just a note, this um, thing called epoch is um, the number of seconds since a certain date happens to be the Unix magic time in 1970, you know, the first, the very first instant in the year of 1970 in UTC. And because it's thought of that way, then when you get the epoch, the number of seconds since that thing for a timestamp TZ value, then it's not affected by the session time zone. And here's a little demonstration of it doesn't matter whether I um, query up this particular um, timestamp value in um, a reigning time zone of what's good for LA or in a reigning time zone of what's good for Kathmandu. 
you know, minus seven or plus eight and three quarters, sorry, plus five and three quarters. The result is the same in both cases, okay? Um, and sometimes that's useful because this is the closest thing you have that lets you actually inspect the real recorded timestamp TZ value without any complexity of casting to text and you know, taking acknowledgement of a reigning time zone, confusing the picture. Okay then, now we're on to interval arithmetic. And I should say that this is a huge topic and I'm planning to submit a talk on entirely and only this for the in-person Postgres bash in um, San Jose in the new year. But I'm going to give you a little, you know, taster of the main highlights here and now. And essentially, I'm going to show you examples where weird things happen and caution you that you don't want weird things to happen and therefore you should do things right. So though I haven't written the words on the screen, the thing that informs this whole bit of code here is something that you can read large as life in the Postgres doc, though it's exceedingly tersely and I would say confusingly expressed. It says that the internal representation of an interval value is three fields, months, days, and seconds. It doesn't really say why or what the consequences are, except hinting in some mysterious way that this has got something to do with, you know, the magic of calendar time and human convention and everything. And it's supposed to do what you want, but you might get confusing results, it says. <laughs> How useful is that? Anyway, this is just a scheme who shows you what the three fields really are. Now it relies on this function here, which is one of the things that comes in the environment if and only if you download my kit. There it is, and it's got two um, overloads. The one that's interesting here, I won't bother to say what the other one's for, is if you give it an interval value, it will give you a user-defined type who's got these three fields in it. And all I've got here is a little wrapper around that who makes a pretty, um, pretty display of it. What number is this one? This is number eight. Let's just look at number eight. And if I run in this function just by itself here first, I don't know if you know about these exon and t on things. They, um, the exon thing twizzles the columns and the rows, kind of pivot so you can read what would be a very wide row much easier. And this other one gets rid of extraneous column headings. Now, if I just do this on a few example values, let's shift this over and make this a bit bigger now. Clear away all that gack and just spray it in. Then what we see is when I use this make interval for one month, I get a pure interval value in the sense that it's got a non-zero field in only one of its fields. It's a pure months value. 30 days gives me a pure days value and that many hours gives me a pure seconds value. But this thing here, which is perfectly legal, some non-integral number of months gives me this animal, a hybrid. And as we'll see in a minute, it's basically utterly meaningless. It's meaningless in two ways. The rules for computing how on earth you get this from this are not documented by Postgres, though I did an empirical investigation and produced a you know, a PLPGSQL implementation that in all tests mimics it. And if you read it, that's a kind of um, external spec of what it does. But you'll see that there's no rhyme or reason for it. Some of it is actually utterly whimsical and stupid. It is what it is. You get what you get. So you can't predict what you get because it's so complex that you'd have to wrap your head in a towel and study it for an hour before you knew what to expect from this. And then anyway, it's a mixed or hybrid interval value, which as we'll see presently, is just a recipe for disaster. So then 
I hope I'm not preaching too much. I hope I'm making the point sufficiently forcefully. You'll never read all this lot. This is number eight continued. So here it is. What I've got here is um, just a table function. If this was Oracle, I wouldn't have used the table function. I'd have used a ordinary anonymous block with um, DBMS output, but you can't do that in Postgres. So that's why it's a table function. But if you just accept this locution, I set it up returning a table of <clears throat> rows that are just one field text, and I create whatever I want in that text and I return it. So, you know, you can almost ignore these things on the right, which is why I've tried to stick them out the way on the right with some, you know, ordered white space. The main point then is that I've got a value here, which is timestamp TZ, and I form it in a certain way. I form it in a way which is sensitive to the time zone that's passed in, as you see here, okay? This bit is fixed, but this bit is sensitive to the time zone. I get this value. Um, in other words, it's transformed into UTC or ref relative to UTC for storage in the light of this. And then I've got intervals, I1, I2, and I3, that are the ones where I just showed you, the fewer months, the fewer days, and the fewer seconds, okay? And then all I'm doing is doing the type, sorry, the text typecast of those interval values. I'm showing the internal representation of the same values. Then I'm asking if they're equal. Surprise, surprise, they will be, but clearly you'll see they're not in any proper sense. That's just because the native equals operator for its overload with two interval arguments is arguably stupid. Though some people would say it's sensible, clearly. If you try telling the Postgres um, hackers that it's stupid, they'll tell you you're wrong and it's sensible. Um, but it's easy to create a user-defined operator and you can find all the um, way to do it in the doc. Um, and what it does is it's strict whereas the other one is casual. And we'll see that this one gives false and this one gives true. And then I'm looking at the effect of adding these intervals and then seeing, do I get the same answer in each case? And well, we'll see what we see. So in one case, I'm doing it in a time zone, LA, which is um, sensitive to daylight savings time. And by the time we've gone from here, cunningly contrived with an interval this big, we've crossed that transition point. And then I'm doing it in Kathmandu where they don't honor daylight savings time. So let's just blast that one through then. That's, um, what number is that? Number eight. I hope you're still with me here. And my get out of jail card is that you can look at all this in your own time more slowly and you can check all the bits that I skipped over in record time in the docs. So this is um, the text typecasts of my interval values. This is their internal representation. We saw that already. Each is a pure interval value of the different flavors, months, days, and seconds. This native equality test shows stupidly my, by my book that they're the same Though in some sense they're equivalent because by some rule of thumb, you know, um, this many seconds is indeed one day. And this many days <laughs> by assertion is indeed one month. Of course, everyone knows that some months are 30, some are 31. And guess what? Some are 28 and 29 too, depending on all the things you know. But um, nevertheless, they're considered all to be equal. But this one, just does a, you can guess, field by field comparison. For this one of mine to come out true, it has to be field wise equal in the comparison and no wonder it comes out false then. And then here's the time stamp I started with. And then here are the results of adding those different interval values, which are nominally, according to one way of looking at it, the same as each other. And it may be hard to read all that lot, but long story short, all of them come out different, right? What's going on here? Briefly, um, <clears throat> when you add months, 
it respects one human convention. Namely, if I'm on the 16th of March and I add a month, I end up on the 16th of April. If I add another month, I end up on the 16th of May. In other words, who cares how many days they happen to be in the months? If I'm on the you know, 15th or if I'm 14th of January and I add a month, sorry, 14th of February, Valentine's Day, and I add a month, well, I'll be in the 14th of March. Never mind if it's a leap year or not. And never mind how many days there are in February in either of those two cases, neither being 30. Because that's the way human beings think, have come to think about what months mean. You know, when someone says, I'll have this ready for you in three months, no one asks, wait a minute, are you talking about February in this lot? And is it a leap year? Um, not at all. Now, when you add days, it's a different convention. It's just, you know, if you're on the 14th of February and you add five days, you're on the 19th. If you add enough days to take you into the next month, however many days that month might be, that is re reflected, but you end up at the same time of day. And just think about it, you know, you arranged an international Zoom with a mate of yours on the Saturday in LA, just before daylight savings time twizzle. Of course, he's in Amsterdam and they don't do that silliness. They wait another couple of weeks. And um, you say, let's just push it out one day. I can't make it today. What you think you're saying is, well, it was arranged for um, five o'clock. Sorry, not five o'clock, noon, my time. In other words, um, nine hours ahead of that for this guy, um, nine in the evening. And um, <laughs> you think when you say push it ahead a day, it'll still be the same thinking. Uh, maybe it will, maybe it won't, you know. If it's just a local conversation, you and your mate down the street, then pushing it out a day, even when it crosses the, the time zone change, sorry, the daylight savings time change, conveys something humanly. But if you're thinking now, of it in those international terms, or conversely, if you're thinking about it in terms of a airplane flight that you know its duration for, and it's, you know, you're either going to take a Saturday flight or a Sunday flight it to Europe at this magic moment, the 15th of March, well, you know that your arrival time will be different at each end according to whether you leave at the Saturday or the Sunday because of this business going on. And that's what this business here reflects. That's why starting on the 10th, you end up on the 10th by month's arithmetic. That's why starting on the 10th, you end up on the 9th by day's arithmetic. And that's why starting at noon, you end up at one in the afternoon when you're using seconds arithmetic. Each of those is a rule who's defined for a certain use case. You'd better understand what use case you have and choose the right rule. And if you ever end up with a hybrid value, you can't choose the right rule. There is no right rule because the whole thing is just a mass of chaos. So that's the whole point that I was trying to make with this. I hope that's clear. Um, I'm gonna have to rush a bit to reach the end, but I might just go over a moment or two. How are we doing? Oh, I am over a moment or two already. Right then, so um, this is the example and I showed it to you already down here, I'll just show the second half, and that is in a time zone in, sorry, daylight savings change agnostic world, you still get this effect going on, the 10th or the 9th, but these two are now the same as each other as is shown by that, because there was no daylight savings change in the picture. The same would happen in, in LA if you happen to start in July and go forward into August, because there's no daylight savings time change then. Right, so this is the main point there. These rules are sensibly defined for different, distinctly different use cases. You need to know what your use case is. And if you have a hybrid value, well, you've got no rule going on because it's all just mixed up into chaos. So then here's another example. Um, it's much the same kind of thing, but a different twist on it. Um, again, maybe it'll be simpler if I just look at it over here in the um, view where I can scroll my text and shrink and enlarge it. Um, we're almost at the end, number nine. All I'm doing is defining a certain um, 
timestamp and a different timestamp. And then I'm subtracting them to get an interval value. And then I'm taking that difference and I'm um, adding it to the first one to get a new value. And then I'm comparing if, <laughs> if it comes out as I expect. And here it is in more plain English. There's T1, there's T2, there's the difference. And there's the, diff you know, the first one plus the difference. And if you algebraically simplify that, you'll see that's T2. And then I'm saying, is this thing, which simplifies down to T2, equal to T2? Well, guess what? Um, if we do number nine now. Okay, it's false. They come out different. Well, that's just life, if you like. Of course, I cunningly contrived it here that I had a mixed value. I didn't exactly contrive it. I simply subtracted two timestamps. And it's a fact that if you use the raw functionality and subtract two timestamps that are far enough in part, you get a hybrid interval value, which never has a non-zero months part, but typically has non-zero days and seconds parts. Ergo, you're going to get um, in a mess if you try and use it to add on to anything. So um, there's one final example, and then the point is made really. Um, it's just uh, another variation on the same sort of thing, and I'm not gonna show it now. I'm just gonna get on to the um, recommended practice. And basically what I'm saying is, um, I've thought all this through. The only way to manage is to create some custom domain types for specializing the things. And in other words, they ensure that you get a pure months, pure days or pure seconds um, interval value, no matter what you do, because the function that goes with the domain definition ensures that. So either you get errors if you do something wrong or you'll know you're right. And um, I'm not gonna go into all this now, but the moral is it might seem dauntingly complicated, but it's easy enough to do it once you accept that it's the best practice. So here's the summary. You've seen many ways you can produce nonsense results. Here's how to avoid it. Use only timestamp TZ to persist date time values. And if you want to um, record this extra information by the side, and then you can always derive what you need when you need it. Beware of it tomorrow arithmetic. And the way to do that is by adopting the practices um, here. Actually, that's a more general recommendation. And here for the interval stuff. And to write brand new application code, if you're simply to ha happy to accept this without obsessing about on all the reasoning that supports it, you don't have to study too much. In fact, just these sections out of the vast entire date time section and Otherwise, if you have to maintain extant date time code, especially for you if it's poorly commentated, has no external design doc, and its authors have just disappeared off the face of the earth, well, you just have no choice but to study the whole shooting match, make sure you understand it, and then try to weed out in the extant code things that have clearly been implemented according to your best guess of a sensible functional spec that doesn't exist, wrongly. So then, enjoy. And finally, I'm not going to spell this out, this just reminds you what Yugabyte is in the world. It's the best of Postgres and Google Spanner combined, and there's all sorts of places you can read about it and, and get on with it. So then, I'm done now. I'm sorry I went on just a bit. I'll just blame that on the complexity of the topic, my enthusiasm, and some wasted moments at the top. So then. Hey, that was great. Thank you so much, Bran. Um, actually... You've now come to understand timestamps and all that rubbish for the oh, first time. You know, yeah. I'm not technical, but I understand that now. <laughs> well, you understand it's hard stuff, I assume. Oh, right goodness. Now. So then with that, um, I think let's call it. Um, Bryn, thank you once again. Thank you so much. Um, your presentations are always so great. 
um, at the Post Progress Conference Series. And to all of our attendees, thanks for spending a little bit of your day with us. And I hope to see you at future Postgres conference webinars.